بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode in our series on القوائد الفقهية Islamic Legal Maxims In our last session we talked about the fourth of the leading the major legal maxims Abdullah Yuzel, harm is to be eliminated. Today's maxim is Dar'ul Mafasidi Muqaddamun Ala Jalb al Masalih. This is a corollary of that previous maxim. It means that averting harm takes precedence over achieving benefits. So most things in this life are a combination of positive and negative. You know, they have beneficial aspects, they may have some harmful aspects. So how do you weigh the action that you're supposed to take with regard to such things? So if the benefit outweighs the harm, then that thing or that action would be lawful. If the harm outweighs the benefit, then it would be unlawful. And if they are balanced so that they seem to be pretty much on a par with each other, then based on this maxim, the prevention of harm should take precedence over the achievement of benefits. So in other words, doing that thing which involves this combination should not be done should be avoided. And there are two Arabic words that are used in this maxim that should be studied in a little bit of detail. Mafasid is the plural of mafsada, which comes from the verb fasada, yasudu, to be or to become spoiled, impaired, corrupted. And linguistically, mafsada is a cause of corruption, evil, or harm. Al-Iz ibn Abd salam the great Shafi'i scholar, who is called Sultan al-Ulama, the Sultan of scholars, he defined maslaha and mafsada in this way. He said there are four types of maslaha, benefit. There are pleasure and its causes, and happiness and its causes. And likewise, there are four types of mafsada, pain and its causes, and sorrow and its causes. So, pain and pleasure are related to physical sensations, and happiness and sorrow are related to emotional states, psychological states, spiritual states. And because, you know, so far, you know, somebody like Sigmund Freud would probably agree with Elizabeth ibn Salam insofar as that goes, but because he was a Muslim scholar, he added, he said, and all of these categories apply to both this world and the hereafter. So there, something can be a cause of temporary pleasure here and a cause of pain in the hereafter and vice versa. Now, Al-Ghazali, he looked at Masada and Maslaha for more rigorous Sharia angle. This is a very famous definition. People are always quoting it. Because he was like the first person to actually formally identify these categories, it seems. Perhaps his uh, teacher, Ajoy, may have preceded him. But this particular quote is very famous for summing up this issue. He said, the intent of the Sharia regarding humanity is fivefold to preserve for them their religion, their lives, their ability to think, their progeny, and wealth. Everything that includes in its effects preservation of the five fundamentals is a maslaha, benefit. And everything that leads to a loss of these fundamentals is a nafsada, harm. And repelling it is a maslaha. So 
If we look at this combination of benefit and harm, sometimes it takes a deep understanding to properly weigh benefit and harm. Classic example from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu when they went for Umrah and the Meccan disbelievers, they came out of the city fully armed to prevent them from entering. And the Muslims were only very lightly armed. They hadn't come to fight. And so there were negotiations and it led to this treaty, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And the terms of the treaty included provisions that a lot of Muslims found demeaning, you know, that this was not a good treaty from their opinion. So, for instance, they were not going to be allowed to actually enter the city and make Umrah that year. They had to go back home and there was agreement that they would come back the next year and that the Meccans would allow them in for that. Also, they agreed that if anybody accepted Islam in Mecca and came to Medina, the Prophet would be required to send them back to Mecca. And the opposite did not hold true. If a Muslim decided that he was fed up with Islam, he wanted to go to Mecca, then the Meccans were not required to send such persons back to Medina. So a lot of the Sahaba were upset by the terms of this treaty. And yet the revelation came and described it as a victory. And the Prophet ﷺ was very firm about that. And as it turned out, because the treaty brought about a cessation of hostilities between the two sides for a period of 10 years, what that allowed the Muslims to do was to mix freely, travel freely to the peninsula, and they were giving da'wah freely, which they hadn't been able to do under the wartime condition that had been in place since the Hijra. And it's mentioned that more people accepted Islam in the intervening period, which was maybe two years or so, between the time that the treaty was signed and the time that the Meccans broke it, whereupon the Prophet ﷺ gathered 10,000 Muslims to march on Mecca. You know, there weren't anywhere near 10,000 Muslims in Medina to go out on a military expedition. So the majority of that army was made up of people who had accepted Islam in that period of time when the truce was in effect. So because the benefits which were not so apparent to some people were greater than the drawbacks of the treaty, the Prophet ﷺ, that's why went ahead with it. There are all kinds of textual evidences for this principle. In Surah Al-An'am, Allah says, after my statement, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ So this is addressing the believers. Do not revile those whom the idolaters call on besides Allah, lest they in their hostility and ignorance revile Allah. So the Quran is full of criticisms of shirk. However, for the Muslims to not just present reasoned arguments, but to use language which is insulting about what these other people hold dear, that is unwise and unbecoming of the Muslims. Because what's that going to do? You know, the very word belief comes from a word which means love. Belief in ancient German meant love. So the things that you believe in, those are dear to you. So if you believe in some deity that you represent in the form of a statue, and somebody insults that deity, then you're going to be insulted too. And the natural reaction when somebody insults you is to insult them back. So you insulted their deity, they're going to insult the law. And that, you know, is in itself a mafsadat for the creation of a law to be 
cursing their creator is a mafsada, it's unbecoming. And then it's also going to harden their hearts and make it less likely that they would be able to accept the truth. So this behavior it might feel good to the Muslim, but it has all kinds of harm embedded in it. Therefore, it's prohibited. Well, let's take a break and then we'll pick it up after that. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. We're starting to talk about the Prophet Sallallahu There were occasions when people would exhibit very rude behavior to the Prophet Sallallahu And they were ostensibly Muslims. And when that happened, companions like Omar, you know, frequently the stories are related in relation to Omar, that Omar would become furious and he would ask permission from the Prophet to chop off that man's head. And the Prophet would never allow him to do that. He said, I don't want people saying that Muhammad kills his companions. So those who are present know that this person crossed a line that he shouldn't have crossed. But if you're living far away and all you know is that, yeah, you know, you just hear the capsule wrap-up of the news. Yeah, did you hear? There was this guy who was a Muslim and Muhammad, وسلم, he had his followers cut the guy's head off right there. So obviously, if you heard that news and you're a non-Muslim, what would your reaction be? Like, huh, uh, remind me never to join that religion. So the hypocrites posed a great deal of harm to the Muslims. In fact, greater harm than open disbelievers. Despite that fact, killing them was prohibited because doing so entailed a greater harm. Also, there is numerous evidences also from the Quran with regard to liquor and gambling. Surah Baqarah. يَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعٌ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا They ask you, this is addressing the Prophet ﷺ, they ask you about intoxicants and gambling. Say there's great sin in both and some benefit for people, but the sin is greater than the benefit. So because of that, the fact that the harm is more than the benefit, they were prohibited. So what's the benefit in liquor? Now there's some medical studies that if you drink moderate amount of wine every day, one glass, let's say, that it will reduce your cholesterol. Okay, that's true, but you know what? You can also reduce your cholesterol by other means. And in fact, it's not wine per se that does it. It's a substance that's there in the grapes. So if you drink the grape juice, it'll do the same thing. And, you know, what are the other effects of alcohol that kills brain cells and destroys your liver? And people, when they're drunk, they do things that they would be ashamed of doing when they're sober. It's a contributing cause of car accidents. Many reasons why it's harmful. And so because the harm far outweighs the benefit, it was prohibited. In fact, there's a general principle that the reason that things are prohibited is because the harm outweighs the benefit. In Surah Al-Araq, when Allah is describing the function of the Prophet ﷺ, He says, وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرُّ عَلَيْهُمُ الْخَبَائِثِ He will make lawful for them all good things and prohibit for them only the foul. So the foul is something in which the harm it outweighs the benefit. There's also the case where the Prophet ﷺ, he was in front of the Kaaba with Aisha and he informed her that you know, the current shape of the Kaaba is not the original shape. It used to be a rectangular building, now it's a square building, a cube. And he said, if it weren't that your people were so recently immersed in disbelief, I would have torn down this building and put up a building on the original shape. But when was he making that statement? It was on the occasion of Fatih Mecca or not that long after that at the 
farewell pilgrimage. The people who had become Muslims in Mecca, they were very new Muslims. And if it was at Fatu Mecca, they had just suffered a military defeat. So one of the things that was their most important religious symbol, to tamper with it would have created bad feeling in their hearts. So that was not something that Afsalan wanted to do. And it was important to win their hearts. Whereas the shape of the building was not something that was you know, a requirement that it be that original shape. It would be nice, but... And because of that, scholars after have resisted the idea of ever changing it to that shape. Now, if we look at some examples of how this principle is applied in fiqh rules, I remember Abdullah Azam, rahimahullah, he was talking about when Arabs came to help the Muslims expel the Russians from Afghanistan. They had invaded the country, so they were trying to repel the invader. So the Arabs were used to praying in certain ways. They put their hands up higher. The Afghans, being Hanafis, would put it below their navel. They would wiggle their finger in the tashahud, those kinds of things. So because the Afghans that they were fighting beside were mostly peasants, they hadn't had much education of any kind. And so they learned a certain way to pray from their village mullah, and they understood that this is the right way to pray. Any other way is a mistake. Their horizons were not broad. So from one angle, it might be beneficial to broaden their horizons by, by showing them there are other ways to do it that are valid. But if they're not you know, psychologically prepared for that education, and your primary goal in being there is to cooperate in order to repel an end, then this education issue can be addressed in some other way, not in a way that leads to conflict. A similar thing that I saw this personally myself leading to conflict you know, when we were studying in Medina, you know, young guys who are coming from different parts of the world, and you're starting to get exposed to hadith here, hadith there. And so this young man from Trinidad, he heard the hadith that he prayed in his leather socks. And his companions also used to pray in their leather socks. And they use those leather socks the way we use shoes. They walk around outside and into the mosque and pray. So this uh, student at the university, he heard the hadith, and so the next time he went to the Masjid of the Prophet, he wore his shoes into the mosque. And immediately, the, as soon as he came in, you know, two or three people jumped up and came to him and said, you shouldn't be doing that. He said, it's sunnah, you know, and he became very defensive and very kind of aggressive in interpreting their behavior as munkar, you know, this objectionable behavior, you're rejecting the sunnah. Well, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, the masjid in which he prayed, the floor of that masjid was just the dirt of the ground. And, you know, they used to make sajda on the pebbles. So walking into that kind of a situation, wearing shoes, is pretty different from a situation where you have rugs. And walking on the rug with your shoe that has mud on it, perhaps, will make it difficult for people after you to put their head down on that same spot. So is it a greater application of the sunnah to wear your shoes into the mosque, or to follow the example of the Prophet ﷺ when in his behavior regarding tearing down the Kaaba and rebuilding it, he avoided it in order to avoid negative psychological reaction of the people that would 
not be able to interpret that deed according to his intention. So there is strong justification for not wearing your shoes into a mosque where they have rugs and things like that. There's the other issue, which is very current in our time, rebelling against an unjust Muslim ruler. There are hadiths about it, and there's also a scholarly explanation regarding the prohibition that, you know, if you're going to replace someone you know is unjust, then there are two possibilities. You could get somebody who's better than him or someone who is just as bad or worse. So the process of getting rid of him is going to for sure lead to loss of life, loss of property. And so the general rule is that you're not supposed to rebel against Muslim rulers. We've come to the end of our time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.